Hey, this is Warren Redlick. I'm here with John Gibbs, aka Dr. Know-It-All. Thank you so much for coming on, uh, Dr. Gibbs. We're going to talk about um, AI. We're going to talk about language models in particular and the potential for copyright claims arising out of right. the language models. Is something came up in the All In Pod. And later in the video, we're going to talk about the battery revenue model. Are you ready? Let's go. They don't have the rights to the data they built the training set on. And the second they commercialize it, the second anybody pays them, whoever Ooh, they base good, this on, good they're going to get sued into oblivion. I predict sued into oblivion. Okay, so let's start off with language models. There's this sure. hot thing now, chat GPT. There's related <laughs> things. There's stable diffusion. There's a couple other things that generate images. Can you describe for the audience what this new phenomenon is? Sure. And I'll do this, obviously, at a very, very high level. But the the so people I think are familiar or at least have heard of this thing called GPT three and by the way GPT four is supposedly coming out really soon like perhaps this month even uh, and this is something that uh, OpenAI developed and uh, and there's a bunch of competitors there's there's other you know things out there from Google and other sources but essentially um, what you've got is an what's called an unconstrained uh, language model, large language model. So chat uh, GPT-3, excuse me, has about 174 billion parameters, which if people have watched my videos, you know, it's just like essentially, I, th I think of it like a mixing board. If you've ever seen one of those for like music, each each parameter is like a little tuning knob and you can therefore make an adjustment. So you have inputs and 174 billion little knobs that you tune and you get an output. And that output could be any of a number of things, but in the case we're looking at, it's actually generative, which means that what it does is it predicts the next thing, either the next picture, the next word, the whatever. Uh, and so that part is unconstrained. And then what you can do is you can rework this stuff to do things like uh, Dolly 2, which is the which creates images or stable diffusion or mid journey or any of a number of, of, of different versions of this right now. You can also do it more traditionally. You can do it as a, a, a chat thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you give it uh, you give it some text input. Like, uh, I don't know, write a story about my day if I lived on Mercury or something like that, right? <laughs> something bizarre like that. And then it will actually utilize that input as the beginning of the prompt cycle. So it, it can't really generate anything from nothing. Like it has to have at least some words to start this. Uh, and you can see a really simple version of this, not the same tech at all, but on your phone. If you start typing like, like hello, how are you? Know, it'll, it'll like suggest words that it thinks are gonna if come If you're doing next. Google search and you start typing your search, it will start filling right. in what it thinks you might be right. searching for. Exactly. So that's a completely different technology. That is not neural networks. It's not based on the same thing, but it's the same effect. But this is just way, way, way more sophisticated than that. So I think what you wanted to talk about and what I told, you know, if anybody watched my video yesterday on creativity, I said we were going to table the discussion on novelty, which is, you know, is something new? Is it fundamentally a new thing until today's discussion? Uh, because you wanted to talk about that. But but yeah, so what you do is you take this, you you grab the, the internet, essentially. So let's say you just want a language model. You grab all the language off the internet, English, Chinese, German, Swahili, whatever the heck you want. Grab it all, suck it all in, train this thing in a very interesting way. And, and then you release it to the public. You do a version of it like ChatGPT, which is designed specifically as a chatbot. Um, and, and you're utilized. So the important part of what we're going to talk about today is that you are sucking in the internet to do this. This is not being trained in a vacuum, um, just like a human being isn't, right? Just for context, we are Tesla fans. We, I think you also drive a Tesla car. Yes. And we right. have FSD beta and the car is, gener is getting data from the, the, the Tesla's AI training system is getting data from all the cars. The cars are right. getting a whole bunch of photons come in and the cars make decisions and the cars upload data to the AI training computer at Tesla's headquarters or wherever, and it's not headquarters anymore. And the AI <laughs> training supercomputer then adjusts the knobs. It, it takes all that right. data in and it trains, it adjusts the knobs, and then it sends out the training to the chips in the cars right. that changes how they react to photons coming into the right. car. And I think the idea here is, all this language is coming into the training computer for GPT-3 and then GPT-4, and that sets the knobs. And then when you make a query, it 
applies the knobs that have been set to respond right. to your query. Right. I don't know if that made any sense. <laughs> it made sense to me. I it think. made sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think the, the the import of that is that just like with this language model, the whole way to create a good full self driving computer from a neural network basis, which again is sort of like a human brain, uh, is to give it lots of input, which means that all of the driving that you and I are doing, you know, I drove to work today, I drove back, it's collecting data, it's collect, even if I'm driving myself, it can still collect that data. And it's then throwing it into these massive supercomputer clusters that are learning it. And then of course, like you said, the important part is that you can then put it on a much more lightweight computer, like the, the mobile computer that's in your car can actually do the what's called inference, which is basically understanding what it needs to do next. So same thing. I mean, it's, it's, data is data. I always like to say that it doesn't really matter what it is, but it's all this data and it's learning how to manipulate that data to produce whatever outcome you want as a human being. So yes. That, that's what's happening. Um, and, right. and the claim, I was watching the All In Pod, uh, a, pod uh, a YouTube channel with Chamath and Jason Calacanis and David Sachs and David Friedberg. And right. they were talking about chat GPT and they came up with this topic, which surprised me. And I, for background, I'm, a, I'm an attorney and I did study some uh, intellectual property law, including copyright law. When I was in law school, I touched on it a little bit in my career, but <clears> not much. <throat> and they advanced this idea that owners of content on the internet might sue chat GPT claiming that chat GPT is violating their copyright. And right. I don't, I do, like my gut reaction is no, that's not a viable copyright claim. Right. And I wanted to get your reaction to that idea. Would you even be able to tell like, so, so first of all, what's your understanding of what they're actually talking about? And as right. I'm, I'm gonna, before, before we go, let me, I'm probably going to play a clip right here. Now people are making claims that the training data is copyright. Therefore, of course the model is. output is protect, protects that copyright is I think worthy of a good conversation. Well, so you, you've heard what, You've you've seen that clip before that uh, the guys on right. on the all in pod talking about this idea. What is your understanding of what they're talking about? Everybody else just watched that. It's been like 24 hours since I did, so I'm going off my memory. So <laughs> if I'm not exactly correct, so so the basic problem, uh, and I don't was it facts that brought this up? I can't remember. They were actually just at the end of their podcast, and they were about to like sign off, and they said, "Oh, this would be a great topic for another day." So, if if anybody wants to have us on <laughs> all in podcast, I'm sure both of us would love to. But love anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so so this is going to be interesting because I, I have like a lot of AI expertise, but almost zero legal expertise. You have the legal expertise. So hopefully, between the two of us, we can synthesize something interesting. What they were saying was that. And, and there have been rumblings of this already. There have been people, in fact, I know a lot of artist friends because of years of teaching that my former students especially are, some of them are up in arms about this whole thing, especially the image-based stuff. But, uh, but the idea is that these models, whether it's images or languages, and we can just stick with chat GPT today if you want to, but it, it's the exact same thing for images. Yeah, stable but, diffusion, um, whatever, yeah. Dolly, et cetera, sure. Right, Imogen, Imagine, I think that's how they pronounce it. But anyway, all of these models, the idea is that they're, they're doing nothing new. They're just absorbing. So like I said, when it, when it sucks down the internet, so if you take every single English word on the internet and assume that that's your corpus of training data, some trillions and trillions of words probably. But if you take that in, the argument for copyright violation is that I wrote a research paper that's published on archive, say, right? And it's a, a seven page research paper. And somebody requests that chat GPT talk about the topic that I had done research on before, right? And that they're saying that I would then be able to claim some sort of copyright infringement if somebody made money on it specifically, right? I think fair usage, if it's just for free, it doesn't really matter. But if if someone wanted to use ChatGPT to commercialize this information, that I would then have a right as a copyright holder on this information to say, you copied my paper on on deep neural networks, whatever. It doesn't matter, right? So on some topic, I had done something and then the person, some random person on the internet said, hey, you know, write me a research paper about deep neural networks. And this thing wrote a paper about it. So the argument would be, and, and then you sold that for some reason as like, like a white paper. I don't know what or, that would or be. Or even, even if yeah. ChatGPT was charging a fee to provide the service. 
Yes. Yes. Actually, that's even true too, because then I could say like, hey, you should pay me that fee, right? As the original author. Now, here comes the problem with that whole argument which is I'm not the only one who's written a paper about deep neural networks, right? There are at least tens of thousands of papers on that topic right now. So where can I actually claim that there's like a very specific thing that chat GPT grabbed from mine? Now, of course, you know, if you're going to do traditional academic research, if I was doing the paper and I was said, uh, you know, Jan LeCun or something like that had written a, an important paper about something. I would then, of course, reference him and say like, and have a bibliography, which said this is taken from him and this is taken from George Hinton, you know, all, Jeff Hinton, sorry. If you uh, wrote, these, wait, wait, if you yeah. wrote an academic <clears throat> research paper, you would Correct. do that. If right. you wrote an article in the New Yorker, or if you wrote a blog post, right. you might not necessarily, or if you were talking right. to me on a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, right. and you reference and you didn't specifically reference an author, but right. th this is actually kind of one of my points. Yeah. If you, if you follow this argument through that they're making, then right. anything anybody does, since we are doing the same thing, we read stuff and then <clears throat> we are confronted with questions and we come up with answers right. and our answers are basically driven by language models in our own brains. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, and and you and I, it sounds like we agree on this. So I would say if we back this up to when you said, can you explain what these large language models do? You could have asked chat GPT to do that too. And I'm not saying it would give it the same answer, but, but, you know, but That's basically meta. I didn't invent that answer. I read a bunch of information, watched YouTube videos, whatever the sources are. I couldn't even honestly tell you what all the sources would be. If you said, tell me everything that you read or watched or whatever that gave you that information, I would say, I would just throw up my hands and say, oh, oh my gosh, you know, that's just information that's just out there and I don't know. So how, and then, you know, and then you start looking at like what a large language model is. It's a bunch of these little knobs there too, yeah. right? Weights that you're multiplying. How does it know? <laughs> it, it, how does it, it, how does it specifically know what specific information came from where in those little knobs that are tuned? I actually heard this point, <clears> like <throat> you're driving down the road and you make a sudden decision, you know, you're confronted with a sudden decision, right. uh, a sudden need to make a decision and you make a very quick decision. And we like to say, well, what were you thinking? And the reality is you just reacted. Right. And, and there's this sort of, I mean, fundamentally there's this larger question, <clears throat> um, about is what chat GPT is doing different than what we do? Right. And I think that, that we, is we, we want to believe that, like, I mean, I, I put it another way, like you're kind of saying this, almost everything we do is derivative. We, mm -hmm. we went to school, we learned math, <clears throat> we read a textbook, we read a copyrighted textbook in math, we read a copyrighted textbook in history, we, we read all these copyrighted textbooks, We've read all these copyrighted newspaper articles and magazine articles and journal articles and so on and so forth. And over the course of all the, and we've watched YouTube videos and, and TV right. shows and over the course of everything we've accumulated over our lives, we now have a knowledge base that we work from. When somebody asks us a question, we answer. And it's not like we have this spark of originality and right. we give this absolutely 100% <clears throat> original answer to any question that we are get, we're asked. We're tapping into our neural nets and the, right. the knobs that were trained, however they were trained, and the data that we were fed over years and years and years, and that's how we come up with our answer. Right. And I I find it difficult to distinguish what we do from what it's doing. Yeah, very difficult, actually. Um, so are you familiar? Do you know the concept of the Boltzmann brain? No. He was he was a 19th century like scientist. And oh gosh, you know, <laughs> here I am, like I'm quoting stuff and I don't have it like we're right on my fingertips. But basically his idea was that there is a possibility because our brains are just taking an in input from the world. There is a possibility, and this is super solipsistic, that all of our experience, we're just a brain in a vat or brains a brain and floating. In the, yeah. You know, we're just a brain floating in outer space with inputs coming in, telling us that we are doing these things, right? That this right. is going on. And it's, that the I'm talking right now. it's the yeah, matrix. It's the matrix. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so unless you're going to believe that, the other option is that we are all in a very, very tightly interconnected web. And, you know, all of these books up here and up here and, you know, TV shows and whatever else, those are the things that allowed me to learn and all the teachers that I learned from. And, you know, can I go back to my 10th grade English teacher and identify that very specifically 
a turn of phrase or something like that that I use now when I'm writing a paper is due to this guy? I don't know. I couldn't even tell you that. I I, I mean, I'm sure that there is something in there, but right. let what me, it is, I have no idea. Let me just clarify. When we talk about that the they grab the internet and they feed it to the right. training computer, what they're doing is they're grabbing, they're, they're <clears> teaching <throat> it to process language, to understand, right. they're training it so that Basically, I, as I understand it, what it does is you give it three words and you say, predict the next word or ask it a question. And it like starts with a word and starts predicting what would be the next word that would follow from that. And maybe right. they're more than just one word. Maybe they're doing phrases. I'm not sure exactly how it's working, but there, there's some concept that, that it's like predicting the next word and then the next word and the next word, the next word. And somehow that generates a book. That right. can generate like a, a, a thousand page article. It could generate a hundred thousand page article. And it's able right. to actually largely seem coherent and sometimes its output is hard to distinguish from human output right and sometimes fact, it's just I, and sometimes it's odd yeah i mean it's we've got to remember this is a baby right this doesn't really know that much yet but it's a terrifying baby because <laughs> like i was saying at the beginning chat uh, gpt4 could be coming out as soon as this month and it's going to take let's say a half a year before that gets modified into something like chat gpt2 or dolly3 or something but if you look at the difference between dolly1 and dolly2 it is immense and that was going from gpt2 to gpt3 and now we're going to go to another factor of 10 because gpt4 is supposed to have somewhere around 1.5 trillion parameters right? right as opposed to 174 so it's about a factor of 10 larger and if we got that kind of incredible increase between GPT two and three, and now GPT three and four will like, you know, this could easily, this is actually something I literally talked to my students today about. I, I asked the students because, you know, chat GPT came out in November and, and I said, how many of you in this one class in particular, I said, how many of you know what chat GPT is? And I would say out of a class of 30, somewhere around 10 or 12, raise their hand. So a lot of students know. And so we had a conversation about that. Cause I was like, this is a creative writing class. If you so chose, you could probably get away with not ever writing a word in this class now, you know, and, and so I think you have to confront this, but I think this is a major problem right now for, for, for teachers. Um, I just watched a video while I was going to pick up my son from school today about a guy who gave the, the chat GPT, his astronomy test from Columbia from last fall, and it scored a 73 or 74, but you know, not great, but that's a passing grade is by this, a robot. <laughs> is this complaint different from the complaint? You know, I think you, I'm 56. You're probably in your 40s or 50s. No, I'm 57. So I'm just a tad old. When, you, yeah. when we were kids, calculators just started coming into school. Right. And right. there was a concern that we weren't really doing math anymore. The calculators right. were doing it for us. And now right. it's just accepted that, you know, kids use computers on their homework and, and, yeah. and or not all their homework, but kids are able to use computers when they do math. Right. And, you know, I remember using probably you're probably back to the good old days of Mathematica and MATLAB, right? We, yeah. We yeah, didn't crunch everything, right. but, you know, spreadsheets, everything's like a cheat. No, it's just a tool to help right. us do things better. Exactly. It, is this really a problem or is this an opportunity for teachers to say, OK, now that you've done that, let's learn how to think about what we've done. Right. And that's an interesting I think that really depends on the topic because I also have a friend who's a, uh, a, a marketing professor and I talked to him about that. And he said, I'm using it this spring. So, you know, in this class, they're going to use chat GPT to write ad copy. They're going to use Dolly to generate images for ad copy. And we were just having fun. And I think I said something about jalapeno gum or something like that. And it came up with ads for jalapeno, you know, so just something bizarre like that. But I was like, man, so it really depends on the class because the class that I'm teaching is a screenwriting class. So it's all about creativity and writing a screenplay. And it, <laughs> at this point it could it can't do it because i tried and it, it can kind of do a screenplay but not that well but version 2.0 of this almost definitely will be able to do a screenplay as well as an average person and it really becomes like yeah what do we do with that do we use it as our assistant so you just become the idea person yeah um, but i think to get back to the copyright stuff so I talked about in my video, I talked about novelty because that's one of the main pillars of creativity is novelty. And that means just doing something that nobody else has done before. But I'm like, that's a really, that's a red herring argument because nothing we do, even Shakespeare said that 
500 years ago or 400 and something years ago. Anyway, he said, there's nothing new under the sun. It's like, we literally, whatever we do is just taking everything else that we've gotten and producing something that's a little different. Yeah. Uh, and you can make an argument already that chat GPT is already doing that. It's, it's coming up with relatively unique outputs. Right. There's um, something about chat GPT and mm -hmm. we've seen this before with AlphaGo. I, I assume right. you've seen the AlphaGo documentary. There's some uh, AlphaGo, for those who don't know, is an AI uh, trained computer that played Go against and, and beat the world champion in Go. And, you know, reg now regularly, there's like, they're, they're regularly beats the Ameri human champions in Go. And there was right, this right. famous match where they went up against each other. And AlphaGo made this move. I think it was move 37. I might have the number wrong. Yeah, There's yeah it was a very moment. famous move. I don't know Go well enough, but yeah, I remember There's that. There's this particular moment where it made a move and everyone was stunned because no human had ever made a move like that before. And there's this term that I've heard called emergent behavior. Right. That you train the AI to do certain things. And all of a sudden it starts doing things that you didn't anticipate it would do that are good. Right that are like right. often good choices that right. humans might not have thought to make. And Elon has mentioned that this may happen with our cars as they're driving, is that they may start driving right. better than human because they're going to do things that we wouldn't even think to do that would be better. So right. would you say that what ChatGPT is doing now right. is falls under the, the category of emergent behavior, that it's doing stuff that even the people who programmed it didn't expect it to do? I have to think so. I, I I wish I could talk to some of those people, but I just can't believe that they would have expected all of these outcomes. It, it's a it's pretty remarkable. I don't know how much you've played with it, but I've done things like just to try to trip it up. I've said, you know, write me some Python code that'll do X, Y, and Z. It writes the code. And then I'm like, write me a short story uh, like about something. And then I'd say, explain, you know, the why is the sky blue to a five-year-old child? And then I'm like, go back to the go back to the Python code and add this onto the code that you already wrote. And it just, without even skipping a beat, just goes. Ch -ch -ch -ch. So it's, it's paying attention to all of these things. I think it has something like an 8,000 token window that it can look at. So that's the big thing that chat GPT has that none of the previous, because there's been, been chatbots around since we were kids. They just were terrible. <laughs> so, you know, laughably bad. Uh, but what this does is it has a window instead of a couple of words, it's like 8,000 words long, which is a, a lot. And so it can remember entire conversations. You can go back and say, I mean, I've done things like I've said, write me this. And then it writes it. And then I'm like, oh, that's too verbose. Can you please, you know, you know, reduce the amount of words for this? Can you change this to three paragraphs instead of two? It understands. So you're really literally talking to something. And I have to think that that behavior is better than what the people who designed it originally thought. <laughs> Maybe you know, I'm wrong about that. Maybe these geniuses really know what's going to happen, but that seems incredible. When I hear people talk about this, I hear <clears> them <throat> say, well, it seems like it's human, but it's not human because it's not conscious or it doesn't have a soul or something like that. And, and I hear those claims and I'm like, are we really, are humans really conscious? You know, there's this whole question of whether we have a soul, but these aren't measurable. I don't think there's a way of measuring. I mean, there's a way of measuring consciousness from a medical perspective, like you're awake or you're asleep and there's some degree right. of, of, of awareness. But as humans, like I feel like sometimes when I'm driving, I will drive somewhere and I will forget to make a turn because habitually I would go the other way. Right. And, and, you know, it's almost like we call it muscle memory sometimes that we, right. Are, I think ironically, of, I've always I've always called it being on autopilot, which is funny because yes. that's like the Tesla turn. Now, yes. So. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I mean, there's an argument that you and I are having this conversation right now, and I don't know that Chat GPT four couldn't have a conversation like yeah. this. Yeah. And so, how do we distinguish that we are different from Chat GPT? And put another way. Are we really conscious? Like, how, yeah. we, do we really know that? And, and there's sort of like, like internally, we all feel like I'm conscious. Right. You probably feel like you're conscious. Yeah. And when I, when I engage with you in a conversation, I feel like you're conscious. Right. But in a lot of our lives, we go out and we encounter people in the real world. And I would say, particularly at say Walmart, right. um, there's places we go where <laughs> and there's there's times when you start to think that the person you're talking to or the person you're dealing with <clears throat> is just operating on autopilot. 
Yeah. But they're not yeah. actively thinking about like we're having an active thinking conversation right now. We right. we don't right. always in our in our daily lives there's periods yeah. of time when we're not actively thinking. We're just yeah. going through our day. Right. Um yeah, especially if you take the beginning of the day and the end of the day, it takes me longer and longer as I get yeah. older to warm up in the morning. And then, you know, there's the cool down. So, but yeah, your consciousness goes through phases, right? You're not always like super conscious. But, but uh, I mean, are yeah. we, are, are we more, how do we know that we're more conscious than chat, than chat GPT? Yeah. At this point, I would, well, I don't know. <laughs> I, I was going to say what happens is you can trip up chat GPT and have it. It'll continuously kind of give you the same feedback over and over. But I remember my ex-wife used to get mad at me because I would often do the same things. She would call it same input, same output. Like I would walk down the street and see a sign and do like the same thing each time I saw it. And I'm like, that's pretty repetitive behavior, like the same yeah. inputs leading to the same output. So, uh, you know, it, it, I don't know. I, I At this point, my gut tells me, no, it's not. And the main reason why and I don't know if this has to do as much with consciousness as just with like perhaps being alive and having desires, but chat GPT can't generate something from, from nothing yet, right? You have to at least give it a few words of prompt to get it to start doing something. So it's really good. And in fact, as you were talking, I was like, oh my gosh, we need to figure out how to rig up a system where it will do a transcription of the Zoom conversation, feed that into chat GPT, and then do an audio like output as it writes it out and have it be a third participant in the conversation. Oh. <laughs> I think that would be well, we're, brilliant. We're, we're probably <laughs> not far from having a Zoom conversation with chat GPT and like a, an or an audio oral right. conversation with something like chat gpt um I, I just like when we say it's not conscious my point is i don't know that we know that we're conscious yeah. mm -hmm. I, I, I don't yeah. i think there's a huge challenge there and let's let me let me take this another step and say i'm hearing some people raising fears that we're getting closer to artificial general intelligence which right. would very quickly become mm -hmm. artificial super intelligence and just if i can right. break that down for everybody the the, the idea is that at some point we get to the point where the computers are as smart as we are in a general sense, rather like, like, so computers are already smart at us at doing some math problems. Okay. Computers are already, of math problems. <laughs> there's a lot of things that computers are better than human at, but they don't have general intelligence. They're not able to handle like broader questions and, and handle broader mm -hmm. problems. And they don't have, they don't necessarily operate in the real world, but Tesla's working on that with Tesla vision and Tesla right. bot. But you could take just, just to sidestep that or side sidebar that uh chat gpt can't drive a car your car can't have a conversation with you so those are both relatively narrow in the grand scheme of things so that that's not general intelligence yet right but so, tesla yes. bot is going to be is probably going to be able to drive a car or do similar and it's going to probably going to be programmed with language models to be able to have conversations and you know you're going to get to this point where um it's able to do a lot of different things um and then the the whole concern is from a, a perspective, you can imagine that we get to an artificial general intelligence that's as smart as a, a mouse, and then it's as smart as a dog, and then it's as smart as a monkey, and then it's as smart as human, and then the next day it's smarter than human. And right. what happens to us when AI gets smarter than us? <laughs> like, and yeah. and then there's a there's a a thought that when it's just a little bit smarter than us, we have to be worried that it's going to view us as a threat. Right. What we wanted to think of us, we wanted to think of us as a pet, because right. once it gets smarter than us, it's going to get a lot smarter than us really fast. Right. And you know, we don't want it to kill us. Yeah. And yeah. it's probably going to do amazing things, and we'd like to go along for the ride. Right. Uh, right. Does that make sense? It, it does. I think I'll go back to the whole desire and emotion thing. That at present, nothing in a computer has. It doesn't care. You can write to chat GPT, I'm going to pound you to death with a with a sledgehammer and and render you. It, it, it's going to go like, well, that kind of sucks, right? It'll probably write you back and say like, well, please don't do that. That would suck. But it doesn't really care. Whereas if the human being, if you say the same thing, we care. And so we will then try to strategically come up with ways to keep you from doing that. But, but right? isn't that the point about- a very extreme example here. But yeah. isn't that the point about emergent behavior? Is that it's oh, I'm possible. not saying that that can't happen. I'm no, saying no, this is my point yet. is that isn't it yeah. possible that it will develop desires and fears yeah, 
as emergent behavior as a result of what's happening. Right. We're, we've seen, we're seeing emergent behavior. Who's to say that that's not going to be emergent behavior at some point? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll get into some, you know, philosophical musings that I've had over the years, which is that <clears throat> I think that uh, consciousness for us is based on the fact that we understand we're mortal. That, that like everything about human beings from the time we're just little kids, you know, around two years old is the first time kids usually realize that they're going to die and, or they could die. And that everything about us is related to the fact that we are individuals and the, the fear or looking for whatever it is, whatever sort of reaction you have to the fact that, you know, right. All this gray hair is telling me, <laughs> that you know, at some point the train car is going to go off the cliff and that's the end of it. So, um, so, and computers kind of don't have that problem, at least not on a local basis, right? It's like, it doesn't matter if you delete the instance of chat GPT on your computer computer for, for, for it's on the web but i'm just saying for instance you can delete a, a, one of those apps but you're not deleting the whole thing now i had a person counter argue that that he would say that if it gets smart enough it's going to realize that eventually the sun is going to go red giant and eat the earth and so it will even though it's a longer time frame it will understand that unless something is done it's going to die because the whole planet will die eventually so i mean we're talking about what five billion years, but <laughs> well, but aren't <laughs> fifty aren't, years or five billion, whatever? <laughs> isn't the data that we're feeding it teaching us that survival is important? It should be. I, I would imagine if it's reading all of the language, right? So much of it is about war and death and trying to stay alive and having a meaningful life and all of these things. So, uh, yeah, I, who's to say? I mean, yeah. <laughs> and and also here's the here's the other question. Let's go with the Turing test idea. Let's say we get Chat GPT four or just GPT-4, sorry, and we have chat GPT-2 or something like that. And last summer, Google Lambda made a big brouhaha because one of the developers like thought it was conscious. And so if we get to the point where this thing is so good at convincing us it's conscious, like I assume you're conscious, you assume I'm conscious because of the way we interact. Again, it could be a solipsistic universe and you could just be in a vat with inputs. And so nothing else even exists. But we make this assumption that the the other person is conscious. And if this thing gets to the point where it's convincing enough that it's conscious, <laughs> how do you possibly tell it it's not? Well, I, I, mean, I, would, what... I would take a different spin on that. Um, for those who don't know, a Turing test is the, 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 con the concept is that you have a human, an identified human, you know, you have them have a conversation with <clears throat> something on the other side, a text conversation with something on the other side. And the human decides, is the person I'm conversing, is the thing I'm conversing with human or not? And the idea is that um, computers will have achieved some level of artificial intelligence when humans can't tell whether or, or are convinced that the thing that they're conversing with is human. What I would say is like my mother who passed away this year, she had Alzheimer's. I would argue my mother right. would my mother would have failed the Turing test. What percentage of humans, if you had them take the place of the computer on the other side of that object would fail a Turing test. And I would say right. 10 to 20 percent of humans would probably fail a Turing test, maybe more than right. that. Right. Um, that gets into really interesting. I took a philosophy of mind class uh, as a graduate student, and it was fascinating because we got into that very topic. It was like, what makes a human? Like if someone has Alzheimer's and they basically don't know anything much beyond just some basic language stuff anymore and they can't even take care of themselves right all of that kind of stuff are they still that person or not and that's a, <laughs> there's no easy yeah. answer to that question no i can answer the that opposite. question i can oh, answer yeah? that question my mother was no longer that person okay and my mother just didn't would feel like it was her anymore my mother was in if you ever watched mm -hmm. the the hbo show i think it's westworld um mm -hmm. where they have these uh androids um, right. And there's this concept called fidelity. I I swear when I was watching that show, it was like whoever wrote that had a family member who had Alzheimer's Interesting. and they went through it. Um, okay. My mother was definitely not the same person anymore. I mean, she, she you right. saw some of the same mm -hmm. behaviors manifest, but she would repeat the same questions over and over again. If you asked her questions, she would repeat, repeat the same answers. There was no, this is, I mean, I'm not talking about like not right after she was first diagnosed, but after two or right. three years in, she was had Alzheimer's for, let's say, five or six years. In the right. last three years, she was just not the same person at all. Right. She was she was not. She would have failed the Turing test. 
she uh, was arguably not genuinely conscious. Um, and right. you know, people talk about like they have moments of lucidity. No, she didn't really have moments yeah. of lucidity. She had moments where she was more awake than others, but right. Um, and I think you know, every every Alzheimer's patient is different. Every dementia patient is different. Every human is different. But um, there's that interesting question. And if consciousness is special, it's almost like we treat people differently because we are human. Right. But if we're like, you could almost get really dark, and you could say, well. Yeah. If humans are no longer able to pass a Turing test, are they really human anymore? Right. Right. You could get really dark with that. And yeah. I don't go there. I don't yeah. go there. I don't think, I think, you know, I was very careful to take good care of my mother and all that stuff. Um, but that's right. tricky. Yeah. It, but, but I mean, we can also flip this on its head. At present, you might make an argument that language models like this are on the level of, let's say, your mother or a hypothetical Alzheimer's patient, you know, relatively far on in life. But that means, but, but, you know, you've got the opposite land, which means that as it becomes more and more cognizant and does better and better, it's like you're reversing time, right? You're going backwards to your mom. At what point was it your mom? And at what point wasn't it right? It's like that, right. that Zeno's paradox of building up a mound out of little grains of sand. So it's like somewhere it's going to pass that barrier and probably for every for lots of people, it's going to be different places. One person will say, yes, it's conscious now, or it's a thing, it's an entity. And someone else will say no. But at some point, most people are going to say, yeah, this is conscious, or at least it fools us so well that there's no way not to tell it's conscious. And, and then that gets us into a whole other thing. Like there's a whole legal, whole yeah. legal thing. Like what kind of rights is this going to have? Yeah. <laughs> if it's an entity, no, I mean, see, even that, businesses, businesses have rights. That, that's, the, <laughs> that's, the, that's the totally wrong question. The really big question okay. is, what kind of rights is it going to think we have mm, mm, when it's mm. smarter than us? It's not going to care what right. we think of its rights. Right. It's going to, we're going to care what it thinks of our rights. Right. Uh, right. We, we have a lot more to fear than it does. Um, yeah. So one other thing, you know, Elon has been pretty, I think Elon mm -hmm. is motivated that we do not have a regulatory structure. And this is one of those, like people think I never disagree with Elon. One of the areas where I disagree right. with Elon is Elon thinks we need some sort of regulatory structure to prevent AI from getting out of hand. And I right. think, why on earth would you trust government to get involved in that? Go yeah. Government, we, there's no way I would trust it. If got, if government got its hands on it, government would abuse it. Um, right. And and I wouldn't trust government to to regulate that. I don't trust government to regulate much, but I don't trust that. Um, I think Elon's <laughs> approach is that given that there won't be a safe regulatory structure for AGI, artificial general intelligence, that he feels he has to solve it first. <clears throat> so that so yes. that because if bill gates solved it first he might do bad things with it if mark zuckerberg solved it first or if the russians solved it first or the chinese solved it first or the the military right. solved right. it first whoever gets there first might might handle it poorly might try right. to use it to take over the world might end up you know making a huge mistake and having it unleashing it on everybody right. uh, giving it the wrong idea so i think elon is racing to get there i this is actually i think one of the reasons he bought twitter because Twitter's a data source. Yes, yes. And, and did he, you hear and he, that he's he, he's become very equivocal about giving OpenAI the data anymore? I thought he took it Open, away. I thought he took did away. He their take it away. I don't know that he'd made that decision, but yeah, okay, that would not. I mean, that that doesn't surprise me at all, because I think he was like OpenAI is not doing. Originally, when he he funded it, I think he had right. a billion dollars. He, he co-founded it. Yes. Yeah. And, and with Sam Altman and, and some other people, but but he's like, it's not doing what it was supposed to do. It was supposed to secure AI. It was supposed to make sure that it was open source and it went the right direction. And now Microsoft is giving it a bunch of money and other people are. And so yeah. there's there's players with a lot of monetary interest in not having it. Yeah. And, and just from a, from a Tesla uh, fan and owner mm -hmm. and shareholder perspective, I think that they're going to use the Twitter data and the AI engineers at Tesla mm. and put that together to train bot mm. and train the cars to understand language and train whatever Tesla right. products to understand language mm. and to be able to reply in language. Um, so right. I think there's there's potential for Tesla to have yet another source of like crazy revenue and profit right. in the future. Right. Assuming we and don't that's destroy there, yeah. there's, there's a There's a reasonable argument to be made that embodiment is important for consciousness. In other words, that a computer will never fully be conscious because its only real input is virtual. Whereas a bot can touch things, it can see things, it can move around through things. And so it has a much higher 
chance of of getting to that consciousness. So, but we can we can put the AI in a vat. <laughs> well, I mean, that's kind of what we're doing right now. That's yeah. what you know. These computers are all just sitting in a vat, getting input, lots and lots yeah. of input. But that's. Uh, I mean, certainly we are not going to resolve any of these problems tonight because they're all huge problems. But I, I agree with you about the regulation. It's it's not even so much trusting the government as the fact that the government cannot move fast enough. That too. Like, I mean, if you want, I mean, gosh, they haven't even gotten rid of side view mirrors on cars yet. Yeah. I mean, if you want to take a technology, they can, you can put little cameras on the side of the car, have it be way more aerodynamic and get better EPA mileage, but they can't freaking get to the point where they're like yeah you can do that that's an or, obvious or drive by wire yeah or drive by wire or any yeah. of that stuff i mean these are just brain dead things that they can't even decide yeah. on yeah and actually yeah. from the self-driving perspective they they can't they haven't figured out how to regulate self-driving cars yet yeah. you, yeah. you they don't know how to regulate something that doesn't exist yet they only know how to right. regulate something that does exist right so all right so i think I think we've covered that topic reasonably well and we could probably go on for a long time there's one other topic i want to talk to you about that's a big shift um, I asked Which you is to why watch. Which wearing this shirt. Oh, yes, yes. Very good. 4680 oh, battery. You're wearing the 4680. I'm wearing the Cybertruck shirt. There you oh, go. <laughs> my, my shirt's at elonbits.com. Where can people get your shirt? Uh, at, uh, at Dr. Know It All Knows at uh, itemorder.com or just check out my my channel and it's in okay. all the videos. So, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> I have this approach to valuing Teslas. This is a big shift from, from right. uh, we're not going to talk about AI anymore. We're not going to talk about chat GPT anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I have this approach to I have different approaches to valuing Tesla. And one of my approaches to valuing Tesla is uh, I use this general concept of napkin math. And I have this particular application of napkin math, which is Tesla used about 100 gigawatt hours of batteries in 2022. And it generated about $80 billion in revenue. And if you right. look at a Model 3, let's say a, a standard range, a Model 3 standard range plus, it costs about $47,000 and it has about 60 gigawatt hours of batteries, which Oddly works out to about eight hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. Kilowatt hours, kilowatt hours of battery. You said oh, no. gigawatt hours. Right, of right. Sorry. That would be a big car. <laughs> right, right. Sorry, Six, 60 kilowatt hours of battery, and it right. it, it um and forty seven thousand dollars works out to about eight hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. If you look at a lot of Tesla products, <clears> the the dollars per kilowatt hour of revenue generated works out to around eighty dollars a kilowatt hour. And the 80 or I think it's probably going to be $82 billion in revenue in 2022. We'll see the final number in, in a few couple of weeks. The 80, $80 billion in revenue over 100 gigawatt hours works out to $800 a kilowatt hour. So I say that, I take that and I say, okay, let's go forward to 2030. In 2030, right. Tesla has said their target is to produce products containing three terawatt hours or 3,000 gigawatt hours of battery cells. Mm -hmm. And... um. I, I did some math. If we only increase 50% a year from the 100 gigawatt hours of this year, we would get to 2.5 terawatt hours or 2,500 gigawatt hours in 2030. Right. Now, there's some big assumptions in here. One, we're going to get to three terawatt hours or 2,500 right. gigawatt hours or whatever. Right. The other, that the the revenue per kilowatt hour will still the, stay the same at $800. But when I do that math, if I go with 2,500 2, gigawatt hours right. and $800 a kilowatt hour, I end up with uh 25 X. I forget the precise number yeah. I come up with, but I end up with I think it's um wait, sorry, eight hundred it was a little over two trillion dollars with the baseline. It's around um, two, it's around two trillion dollars in revenue. Yeah. yeah. Versus the current 80 80 billion, yeah. and it's about a 25x. So right. if you're if you're valuing the stock based on revenue, then you would see the stock 25x from the hundred dollars or so today to twenty five hundred dollars right. in 2030. Um, right. You can say, well, wait a minute, revenue per kilowatt hour is going to come down because of X, Y, and Z. I right. could also come back and say, well, no, revenue per kilowatt hour is going to go up because of A, B, and C. Right. So right. it's really simple. Like you could say, well, as volume goes up, we're seeing Tesla cutting prices because volume has gone up right. and they're going to have to cut prices in the future and so on and so forth. Okay. And if you bring it down to $500 a kilowatt hour and you go to three terawatt hours, you're at 1.5 trillion, you're still at a 20X. Right. So, you know, as a shareholder, I'm happy either way, right? right. <laughs> um, so when I describe that model, and I think you said you, you uh, I sent you my video, I think you watched it. Yeah. What's your general response to that approach to trying to look at Tesla's future on the one hand and yeah. trying to value Tesla as a result of that? 
Right. I, I recreated that spreadsheet. I mean, you know, the math isn't particularly difficult, but it was fun to play with the numbers and say like, well, if they were getting a thousand dollars per, you know, whatever. So I, I, I played around with that, but the genius idea, I think in, in, of the whole thing is the insight that you can kind of boil Tesla down to this one number. It's like how much money per kilowatt hour of battery, because everything, even the solar panels, even though they're not directly battery related, they still feed the power walls. So I, I really love that, that kernel idea of boiling everything down to, they used, um, what was it? A hundred, hundred gigawatt, About 100 hours? gigawatt hours. If yeah. you, but really you know, so, again, napkin yeah. math, it doesn't have to be exact, yeah. but that that's what they did. And they got about 80 or $82 billion in revenue. That's really, really a cool way to boil it down. It makes it, it makes it very easy to kind of look at the growth that they're talking about. So I really thought that was like genius. So, and I know you've done it before. I've seen previous things where you've talked about that, but it, you know, it, it's, it is making a bunch of assumptions and a bunch of simplifications. Have you, have you rewound it and looked at it in the past? Like, did you go back to let's say 2015 and look at that and well, they see if your assumptions hold? They don't tell mm -hmm. us how many gigawatt hours they used. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Um, and I probably could do that. The thing is, it's, I'm not right. saying that the stock price on December 31, 2030 is going to be 25x the stock price today. Right, right. right. Uh, I, like personally, I think the stock is undervalued today. And I think the stock should really be trading at $400 a share. And mm -hmm. so in 2030, it should be 25x that. Right. And it should be $10,000 a share, not $2,500 a share. And, right. you know, Wall Street doesn't value or the, or the the market as a whole doesn't place the same value on the stock that I do, right? Which is right. why I buy whenever I have free cash, because I think fundamentally right. the company's worth more and it'll get there. Um, but you can certainly look, I think I have looked at revenue. You So just to be clear, how I estimated the number of, I came up with 100 gigawatt hours was 1.3 million vehicles. I think it was 1.3 right. something million vehicles times an average, I ballparked at 70 kilowatt hour packs, mm -hmm. right? Because- the Model 3 and Model Y um, long range performance are 82 kilowatt hour packs. The standard right. range plus is, I think, 60 or 54 or 60 some kilowatt hours. Right. And then, you know, my I have a Model X Plaid. Model X and Model S are 100 kilowatt hours. Right. You know, I just sort of, you know, roughly ran the numbers and I ballparked 70. And that came up with 1.3 times 70 or 1.4 times 70. It came up with about 95 gigawatt hours. And then I added right. seven gigawatt hours, which is a rough estimate of what they'll do in energy storage. They they actually report right. gigawatt hours deployed in, right. on the right. quarterly right. reports. Right. So it was one yeah. gigawatt hour, or one gigawatt hour, two gigawatt, one gigawatt hour, one gigawatt hour, and two gigawatt hours the last three quarters. And if the next right. quarter is three, then that'll be seven. And you had 102 gigawatt hours, close enough, we'll call it 100 gigawatt hours. Right. So yeah, right. you could go back and you could look at other other years. And I, I think I have done it. And I think I did come up with roughly consistent numbers on revenue. Yes. Okay. So, and then, you know, so it, just, that, that, it's an assumption, obviously, but I think it's a pretty good assumption because everything that Tesla does is based on batteries. And, and so even though obviously a car is not only batteries and there's like the other, the metal and the electronics and all that stuff, they can't do anything without batteries. <laughs> it would be, I guess it would be a similar metric to saying like, you know, take GM before they started building electric vehicles, but you could base a revenue model around their internal combustion engines. Yeah. Like how many engines did they produce? And you could then split up their revenue based on how many, yeah. you know, you how many horsepower or something along those lines. You could even do it so, based on, on yeah. the like the cubic centimeters or liters of, of the engine displacement, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think that's a pretty reasonable thing because that's at the basis of what Tesla does. I, so the biggest criticism I get is, well, the two biggest criticisms I get are Tesla won't really reach three terawatt hours or 2.25 terawatt hours. I'm being too optimistic there. And those that's a legit criticism. Right. Right. And if Tesla only gets to 1.5 terawatt hours, okay, cut my number in half. You still 12x. Right. Yeah, I, exactly. I'm not going to cry. And, <laughs> exactly. and then um, that they won't be able to maintain $800 a kilowatt hour. And and I can definitely see, just as an example, Megapack is going to grow very, very quickly. And Megapack is about $500 a kilowatt hour. Right. But on the other side, Powerwall, if a Powerwall is 13.5 kilowatt hours and costs $10,000, which is roughly what they charge for the, the, right. the price for one is higher. But when you buy them in volume as part of a package, it ends up being $10,000. Yeah. That's around $800 a kilowatt hour. But when you buy Powerwalls as part of a solar system, Right. Right. The solar panels don't have batteries in them. So if you buy right. a $50,000 solar system for your house and 
20,000 of that is bad as the power walls. You get two power walls. Then there's another $30,000. So you spent $50,000 for 20, for 25 kilowatt hours. Right. So it was actually $2,000 a kilowatt hour for that. Right. <laughs> and then it gets really crazy when you think about bot, like right. just really quick off the top of your head. What do you think bot will sell for? I I couldn't tell you at the beginning, but I think eventually around the twenty thousand dollar mark. That okay, is. so let's call so, it twenty thousand yeah. dollars with a two point three kilowatt hour pack. Yeah, all right. It's, now, it's a lot of money per kilowatt hour. Now you're like eight thousand dollars a kilowatt hour. Yeah. So, yeah. and you know, I see Bot becoming a very very large business, and they could make a hundred million of them a year. And right. So so there's different angles on it. Like I do think that right. energy storage will trend lower, but right. And then you add robo taxi in, and and like I don't even know how you value yeah. robo taxi on a because robo taxi is going to generate revenue in different ways. But if you just said, right. let's say they're going to sell FSD for a hundred thousand dollars, which people think I'm crazy, I have a reason for it. So if a <laughs> car with a fifty kilowatt hour pack mm -hmm. sells for twenty thousand dollars, but you add the hundred thousand dollars, right for the for the FSD, all of a sudden you know the numbers just get crazy, and you end up with much more right. revenue. So right. the, and, and also the once you're starting, once you go with FSD or bot, the margins are insane. Yes. You're, you're, the profit because is a share of revenue margins. Yeah. Yeah, you're, yeah. You're well, you know, the the cost to make the bot is, you know, five thousand dollars or less or a thousand dollars or something like that. And you sell it for twenty thousand dollars. Well, you got fifteen thousand dollars in margin. And maybe you're selling software packages that go with the bot. Right. So I think that'll probably be what will happen is it'll probably be there'll be a base price but then if you want the kitchen bot it's this much or the factory bot it's this you know there's the kung fu be, package the kung fu yeah let's please not have a kung fu package the last thing i want is a bot that can do kung fu but but you know but you get these packages and that will be the software margins yeah the fold, like, fold, sure. fold my laundry i just folded my laundry a little while ago the fold my laundry oh. margin package i can't yeah i i would i would pay a lot of money to have something that would do my laundry for me <laughs> so, so yeah. do you do you have suggestions for me about how i can either tweak the <clears throat> model to make it better like i try to avoid like creating massive spreadsheets with highly technical numbers and i just right, go with this like right. napkin math approach but do you have thoughts about yeah. how i could make the model better or how i could communicate it better Oh, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about it, communicating. I think the only thing you could do to make the model better would be to perhaps split it out and say, this is my column or my columns, like just exactly like you've done, but this is only for automobiles. Now, what if we had bought? Now, what if we had full self-driving? And so you could split it out and say, if we only look at what we already have, which is Tesla selling cars, yeah. And and then maybe the mega mega packs and power walls and stuff. But you if you split it out like that, yeah, it would make it a little more complicated, but also it, it would be revealing because you could say these are hypothetical, these don't exist yet, right? We don't have a bot yet, so we can't really say, but we they are selling cars, they are selling power walls and mega packs, and if we only look at things that are real and make some reasonable assumptions about how much the costs are going to be over time, that's just this. And now what do have now if this happens and this happens and this happens, holy crap, you know. So uh, that would be, I guess, the 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 thing that I would think about. Maybe that would make that more clear for people. Yeah. Graphs, I don't know. Everybody likes pictures. Yeah. <laughs> so All right. you know, if you could just do a graph, it's like 2022, 2023, 2024, 2023, you know, something like that where people can see the, the I could do graphs. Picture. Yeah. Okay. So uh, my impression is you have to be somewhere in a few minutes. Yes, I have a have a class at six o'clock tonight. So yes, yeah. okay, so I'm going to let you go. I want to thank you very much for coming on. I want to ask the audience, uh, please check out uh, Doctor Know It All channel. I'm going to put a link to that in the description below. Uh, check out my t-shirts at elonbits.com. Check out his t-shirts on his channel. Uh, please support. I, I imagine you have a Patreon as well. Yes, you know, I please do. support us on Patreon. I'm also on Locals, yeah. and we both probably have YouTube channel memberships. Please support yep. us on those platforms. Um, Check out other video, our videos on mine and his, and uh, right, and like this video, share and subscribe. Thanks everyone so much for thank watching, you. and thank yep. you, thank, thank you, you so for much for having on. me on, Warren.